on World News Tonight. Escalating war. Russian forces are making significant gains in several Ukrainian cities, now at risk of falling under their control. China policy. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken makes his remarks on China's rise as a global power. Growing outrage. New findings revealed of the traumatic shooting incident in the Uvalde, Texas, as residents gather at the memorial. And celebrating royalty. Corgis take the limelight in Ottawa as part of Queen's Jubilee celebration. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today is on the escalating war in Ukraine. Advancing Russian forces have come closer to surrounding Ukrainian troops in the eastern Donbas region, gaining ground as they press forward with their assault. But Kiev says it is not prepared to give up any territory to appease Moscow. In Ukraine's eastern Donbas region, Russian forces have been making gains. Ukrainian authorities said on Thursday that Russian forces were coming closer to surrounding Ukrainian troops, adding that they briefly seized positions on the last highway out of a crucial pair of Ukrainian-held cities before being beaten back. Among Moscow's victories is the town of Svitlodarsk, which fell to Russian forces earlier in the week. The streets are largely empty and a Russian flag hangs on a local administration building. Drone footage filmed by journalists of the nearby abandoned battlefield showed scores of craters pockmarking a green field surrounded by wrecked buildings. After failing to seize the capital Kyiv in its three-month war, Russia is now trading to wrest full control of the eastern Donbass region, where it has backed a separatist revolt since 2014. It has poured thousands of troops into the region, attacking from three sides in an attempt to encircle Ukrainian forces, holding out in the city of Severodonetsk and its twin Lysychansk. Their fall would leave almost the whole of Luhansk province under Russian control. More than 40 towns in the region have been hit by Russian shelling, Ukrainian authorities said on Thursday, among them Kramatorsk. Ludmila says her apartment was damaged in a strike earlier this week. Moscow denies targeting civilians in what it calls a special operation in Ukraine. In a bid to solidify its grip on the territory it has seized, President Vladimir Putin signed a decree simplifying the process for residents of newly captured districts to acquire Russian citizenship and passports. In a late-night address, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky hit out at suggestions that Kyiv give up territory and make concessions to end the war with Russia, drawing parallels with attempts to appease Nazi Germany in 1938. And behind all these geopolitical reasons, those who advise Ukraine to give something to Russia these great geopoliticians don't always want to see ordinary people, ordinary Ukrainians. Millions of those who actually live in the territory they propose to give in exchange for the illusion of peace. The Kremlin said on Thursday that Moscow expected Kyiv to meet its demands, which include Ukraine acknowledging Crimea as Russian territory and recognition of breakaway Russian-backed parts of eastern Ukraine as independent states. Kyiv rejects those demands. Now, Ukraine's grain mills are struggling to get back into full swing after suffering war damage. That's bad news for global food suppliers as Ukraine is one of the world's top producers of grain. Russian forces may have pulled back from Cherniv in northern Ukraine, but the damage left behind is still there to see. The local Mlibor granary reopened in April after Moscow withdrew from the area. While it meets the country's demand for corn, production is limited after Russian forces damaged the site through shelling. Granary CEO Serhii Yarosh said the flour mill is completely out of order. 
Russia's invasion, which it calls a special military operation, has also led to a blockade of Ukrainian Black Sea ports. And that's bad news for global food supplies, as Ukraine is one of the world's top producers of grain. Pierre Vautier is from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Odessa has to be reopened, and we need to have an agreement uh, to have it reopened. Alors, I mean, this diplomatic level has to be discussed with people who can solve the situation, and then we need to have an agreement. Vautier warned even if a diplomatic solution is reached on reopening the ports, it would still take several months to establish safe export routes. The Kremlin has rejected claims that Russia has blocked grain exports from Ukraine, saying Western sanctions are to blame. On Thursday, a senior Turkish official said Ankara was in negotiations with Moscow and Kyiv to open a corridor via Turkey for grain exports from Ukraine. In a long-awaited speech on the U.S. strategy to address China's increasing power, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken addressed, uh, stressed that Washington does not want conflict or new Cold War. America's top diplomat has outlined the Biden administration's policy towards China. In a 45-minute speech at George Washington University on Thursday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken explained that Beijing poses, quote, the most serious long-term challenge to the international order. Blinken summed up the administration's strategy in three words, invest, align, and compete. He laid out the framework of Washington's strategy aimed at investing in U.S. competitiveness and allying with allies as well as partners to compete with China. He emphasized that the U.S. is not looking for conflict or a new Cold War. We are not looking for conflict or a new Cold War. To the contrary, we're determined to avoid both. We don't seek to block China from its role as a major power, nor to stop China, or any other country for that matter, from growing their economy or advancing the interests of their people. Blinken also noted that the Biden administration stands ready to bolster direct communication with Beijing. We stand ready to increase our direct communication with Beijing across a full range of issues. And we hope that that can happen. But we cannot rely on Beijing to change its trajectory. So we will shape the strategic environment around Beijing to advance our vision for an open, inclusive international system. It's a real pleasure. On the issue of Taiwan, Blinken stressed that Washington remains committed to its one China policy. Blinken's speech coincides with the beginning of Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's sweeping tour of Pacific Island countries, including Papua New Guinea and East Timor. A gunman who killed 19 children and two teachers crossed the grounds of the Texas elementary school without being confronted and entered the building through an unlocked door. Authorities said today offering another new account of the events that preceded the massacre. It was reported that a school district police officer confronted the suspect that was making entry. Not accurate. Officials in Texas on Thursday said the gunman who killed 19 children and two teachers inside an elementary school in the town of Uvalde was able to enter the building armed with an AR-15 military-style rifle and body armor without any confrontation. There was not an officer readily available armed, no. That revelation contradicts an earlier report that 18-year-old Salvador Ramos encountered a police officer outside the school. Not only was there no cop outside, but the door the shooter used may have been unlocked. It appears it was unlocked. So we're going to look at that and try to corroborate that as best as we can. Victor Escalon with the Texas Department of Public Safety briefed reporters about what he described as the, quote, complex situation facing officers who first responded to the shooting inside Robb Elementary School on Tuesday. The briefing came amid an outcry from victims' families about the police response. Cell phone video shared on Thursday showed frightened parents outside the school demanding officers do something to rescue the kids inside. Escalon said earlier Tuesday morning, Ramos had shot his grandmother in the face, wounding her. She called the police. Ramos then crashed his pickup truck outside the school at 11.28 a.m., fired several shots at two bystanders across the street, and walked into the school at 11.40 it would be another four minutes before the police arrived. Officers are there, the initial officers, they receive gunfire. They don't make entry initially because of the gunfire they're receiving. 
It was not until an hour after that a tactical unit with U.S. Border Patrol entered the classroom where Ramos had barricaded himself and shot the gunman dead. Reporters on Thursday asked why police didn't move in sooner. Escalon called it, quote, a tough question. Once we interview all those officers, what they were thinking, what they did, why they did it, the video, the residual interviews, we'll have a better idea. Could anybody have gone there sooner? There are children who've been impacted. The massacre, the worst school shooting in nearly a decade, has reignited a national debate over the country's gun laws. President Joe Biden and his fellow Democrats have vowed to push for new restrictions, despite near-universal resistance from Republicans. Former U.S. President Donald Trump and two of his adult children must sit for a deposition as part of the New York Attorney General's civil investigation into how the family real estate business valued his holdings. Former U.S. President Donald Trump must testify under oath in the New York Attorney General's civil investigation into his business practices. A four-judge panel Thursday unanimously upheld a trial court decision from February enforcing subpoenas for Trump and his two eldest children, Donald Trump Jr. and Ivanka Trump, to provide deposition testimony in Attorney General Letitia James's investigation. James responded to the decision in a tweet Thursday, saying in part, quote, A court has once again ruled in our favor. Our investigation will continue undeterred because no one is above the law. A lawyer for Trump did not immediately respond to a request for comment. In January, James said her nearly three-year investigation into the Trump organization had uncovered significant evidence of possible fraud, including what she called misleading statements about the values of the Trump brand in six properties, saying the company may have inflated real estate values to obtain bank loans and reduced them to lower tax bills. Trump issued a statement earlier this year calling the accusations false and accusing James of a political agenda in targeting him and his family. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Pakistan's ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan disbanded a protest march by supporters after clashes with police outside the parliament, but threatened that they would return unless an election was called within six days. Pakistani protesters in Islamabad dispersed on Thursday, heading home at the behest of the country's ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan. He disbanded a protest march by supporters after clashes with police outside parliament the previous evening. However, Khan warned that they would return unless an election was called. I am giving you six days. You announce elections in six days. You announce it in the month of June. Dissolve assemblies. If you don't do this after six days, I will come to Islamabad again with the entire nation. Khan has said that the confidence vote that toppled him last month was the result of a US conspiracy. He is demanding a fresh election to show he has national support. Khan had reportedly fallen out with the country's military before being removed by a united opposition, which accused him of mismanaging the government, economy and foreign relations. Washington and the Pakistan military deny playing any part in Khan's downfall. Khan had rallied thousands of supporters to Islamabad, with plans to occupy parts of the capital until new Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif gave in to his demands for new polls. Police fired tear gas and baton charged the vanguard of the march. Authorities detained hundreds of protesters who had torched trees, vehicles, shops and a bus station as they advanced. At least 18 police and paramilitary troops were wounded, according to the country's information minister, after dozens of protesters breached the last lines of defence outside parliament. The clashes also spread to multiple cities in Punjab province and the south port city of Karachi. The UN Security Council has failed to pass strong sanctions on North Korea for its recent missile launches as China and Russia vetoed the US-led resolution. North Korea's two closest allies said no to a United States-led UN resolution on Thursday. The UN Security Council resolution would have imposed new, tougher sanctions on North Korea for its latest intercontinental ballistic missile launches. The Council unanimously responded to DPRK provocations with resolutions that impose sanctions 
and bring collective condemnation to a very real threat to peace and security. Today, two permanent members of this council chose to veto rather than act. From the 15-member Security Council, just two, China and Russia, vetoed the motion. The two countries have previously delayed action behind closed doors when deciding on North Korea sanctions. However, Thursday's veto was the first time they have publicly broken unanimity in the Security Council. The country concerned should not place one-sided emphasis on the implementation of sanctions alone, but should also work to promote a political solution. We are convinced that the search for mutually acceptable political diplomatic solutions is the only possible way towards a peaceful solution on the North Korean peninsula. The vote comes just a day after North Korea fired three missiles following U.S. President Joe Biden's Asia trip. Meanwhile, Victor Cha, senior vice president for the Center for Strategic and International Studies, says North Korea seems to have a pattern of disrupting major American national holidays with provocations. He added it's plausible that North Korea could conduct a nuclear test during Memorial Day next to Monday. This will not be the first time North Korea has disrupted a Memorial Day weekend with provocations, having already done so seven times. Eleven newborn babies died in a hospital fire in the western Senegalese city of Tivouan. The president of the country said the tragedy occurred at Mam Abdul Aziz Sidibak Hospital in the transport hub of Tivouan and was caused by a short circuit. Outside a regional hospital in Senegal, the anxious wait for news. Eleven newborn babies have died in a fire in the neonatal department, President Macky Sall has said. Health Minister Abdullahi Diouf Saar told Senegalese television that preliminary investigations suggested the blaze had been caused by a short circuit. <laughs> Local resident Usman Kane said the people of the town shared the pain of mothers who had lost their babies and that the whole of Senegal was in mourning. Senegal has witnessed several health sector incidents that have ignited anger. One example was last year, when four newborn babies died in another fire at a hospital in a northern town. Public health experts have repeatedly warned that many underfunded and understaffed African hospitals have been stretched beyond their capacities by the COVID-19 pandemic, leaving them unable to maintain acceptable safety standards. A national outcry may yet come, but for now the residents of Tivouan and the families of the deceased are left trying to come to terms with this horrifying tragedy. Amber Heard took to the stand again in the $50 million defamation trial brought on by her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. Today, emotional moments in court on the final day of testimony in a trial that has captivated the country. People want to kill me and they tell me so. Every day. Defendant Amber Heard speaking out about some of the public backlash to her allegations of abuse. Sitting here in front of the world, having the worst parts of my life, things I've lived through used to humiliate me. Johnny Depp's legal team taking a final opportunity to grill Heard about what they say was the strategic release of video to TMZ meant to paint Depp in a negative light. You got this going? Oh, really? You edited out the portions that made you look bad before sending it to TMZ. You are very wrong about that. So that if I wanted to leak information, I could have bad. done it in a more effective way a lot sooner. Heard's defense team calling their last witnesses to rebut some of the claims made by the Depp team yesterday. A computer forensics expert pushing back on claims of doctored photo evidence showing bruises on Amber Heard's face. Do you have any reason to question the forensic authenticity of those photos? I do not. Depp brought the $50 million defamation suit against Heard after she wrote a 2018 Washington Post op-ed where she described herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. Though the op-ed never directly mentioned Depp's name, the actor says he never abused Heard and says it has derailed his career. But Heard's legal team says Johnny Depp's alleged substance abuse and behavioral issues were the cause of his career troubles. Taking the stand yesterday, Depp didn't mince words when asked about how he felt about his ex-wife's allegations. Humiliating, ludicrous, painful, and all 
false. Tomorrow brings the final phase of the trial, as closing arguments from lawyers on both sides are set to begin. As Depp's lawyers wrap up their defamation suit, experts say they have a large burden of proof. Meanwhile, Amber Heard's lawyers have no easy task either, as she's countersuing for $100 million. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Indian writer Geetanjali Shri and American translator Daisy Rockwell's Tomb of Sand has won the prestigious 2022 International Booker Prize, an award for fiction translated into English. Global cases of monkeypox are continued to rise with about 200 confirmed and more than 100 suspected cases detected in areas the virus normally doesn't occur. Buildings and landmarks in Sydney were enveloped by a thick fog cancelling ferry services and reducing visibility for drivers. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again on Monday for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with how Canadians in Ottawa decided to celebrate Britain's Queen Elizabeth's 70 years of the throne by holding a parade of corgi dogs, the breed favoured by the Queen. Stay safe and have a good night.